All right, man. It's the after show. I know we're two days late, but I got a girlfriend now and I had to hang out with her for the holidays and it was amazing. And I hate being here without her. So I needed to do something. So I brought in my brothers, man, because almost four days with her, man. I it's like, damn, the more I spend with her, the more I miss her. <laughs> it's and, 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 and I can confirm it's a real girl, not a rubber woman. So it's good not job, a man. rubber woman. It's not a rubber chicken either. <laughs> Jennifer. You, you're awesome, you rule, if you're watching. But uh, how Here's are you guys doing, man? Cheers, man. But well, we went, uh, I bought her, uh, when I first met her, we started talking, and she always wanted to see Trans-Siberian Orchestra. So the first thing I did was buy her tickets to see that. And you know how much I talk shit about that, that, that band, that sabotage and whatever. You know, I, I hate sabotage. I still hate sabotage. I still hate the live music, but when you see it live, it's a totally different animal. I was impressed with the fire, the singing, and Blas Elias is a god. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I didn't know I knew he was good. I didn't know he was that good. I've never seen him live with Slaughter. So I'm like, damn yeah, I mean, that guy you, can fucking you, you got to see you got to see Blas Elias, Al Petrelli, and Jeff Scott Soto all at one show. So and for uh, Mariah, Mar with, Mariah Formica as well. Formica was very great too, man. And it, we got the bet. We got the bet. We got the better drummer on our side. Of Jeff Plate. Jeff we Plate's do. a great fucking drummer, man. Have you seen Blas Old Metal Live? Church guy? Yeah, yeah. I've seen Slaughter before. The other guy's better. Yeah, Damn. yeah. I thought, I thought, no, Blas Jeff. Could, Jeff's a beast. Blas yeah. could turn the sticks while he's hitting the drums, and he's like twirling those shits like in Slaughter. I did. Damn, they fucking... actually they actually gave Jeff a little drum solo during the show this year, which is cool. It's the first time I've seen them that he has like a little drum solo when they they're the first time I, they, they did uh they did nut rocker this year, which they it's the same set list on both on both legs of the tour. It's just the members of the band are different east and west. But mm -hmm. um when they did nut rocker, which anyone who's a fan of Emerson Lake and Palmer will know that, that was one of their kind of signature songs. Um when they do nut rocker, they do um Jeff has a drum solo. I'm sure. I'm sure Blast probably does too. Oh, Blast had one. That's why I go fucking. He's on fire. I, I've yeah. never heard him play like that. It's fucking amazing. He was going off, and they have a blonde chick who was singing. Who's hit? She held this fucking note forever. And it's like mm -hmm. last time I saw a guy, a guy hold a note was the singer of Dirty Honey. He just went, you know, uh, fuck man, that chick is amazing. Yeah, they 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 get. I'll tell you what, they get a great lineup of people because, like, on the East show, we get. Um, Russell Allen from Symphony X and um, Adrenaline Mob, the singer of those bands. He's in the East Band. Zach Stevens from Sabotage. Um, um, Caleb Johnson that won American Idol a couple years ago. A um, couple other really cool, good guy singers. And then these like five of the best female singers you'll ever hear in your life that we have on the East Coast Tour. I know the West Coast Tour, same thing. But I... I'm always very grateful that I get to see the East Coast lineup every year because I think it's my preferred lineup of the two. Would I love to see Jeff Scott Soto and Al Petrelli? A hundred percent. But I mean, getting to see Chris Caffrey and uh, Joel Hoekstra and all those singers every year and Jeff Plate is top tier. Nice. Because I, I was just, I was very impressed. The laser, I've never seen so oh, many yeah. lasers in my life. I saw Def Leppard was the laser king when I saw them in the stereo tour. Oh, no, 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 no. These guys are doing fire lasers. Some girl in a fucking ball coming up and the fire, this whoosh, fire just shooting everywhere. I'm surprised nobody got stairs around fire. And it's like, damn, this is like the video behind him was just so fucking amazing. And uh, I, one guy saying, who's the guy who's, he said this guy has been dead for a while. What's his name? Who died of sabotage? He's the one who started. Paul O'Neill. Well, Paul O'Neill. Yeah, the guy that he was the producer of all their albums, uh, and he was the one that kind of created TSO with with John Oliva and Al Petrelli. They kind of masterminded the whole thing. He was the one that wrote all the stories. So all all, all of their Christmas albums are storylines, which is what they played out. Uh, which is what the tour was. Is the first half of the show is one of their albums pretty much in full telling the whole story and then they do like a greatest hits in the second half and he was the one that wrote the storylines for all the stories that they did and he died probably almost 10 years ago now i think like 2016 it was that he passed but he was kind of like the the figurehead behind uh behind tso and he was 
the one that produced Sabotage from Hall to Mountain King all the way through the end of their career. And because he was saying he misses him, brother, and yeah. this wouldn't happen without him and stuff like that. And uh, he said he did a song Believe or something towards. I don't know. What yeah. Was. So actually, this is the one of the only times I've actually seen them have a little bit of a different set list um, on the East Coast and West Coast tour. On the East Coast, we got When the Crowds Are Gone from Gutter Ballet uh, was the song that they did. And then on the West Coast, they're doing Believe from Streets. Uh, so this is the, the only time I've ever seen them actually do a little bit of a different set list. They actually, they always do like one Sabotage song as a tribute to to Paul and to Chris. Um, and this is the first time I've seen them actually, depending on which tour you see, it's a different song. Damn. I didn't know what song. I don't know the song. I don't know any sabotage song, so I figure that's got to be a sabotage song. So yeah. I was right on that, man. But I, I was amazed. I told Eric he's right, and then uh, Nate goes, "Well, I thought you didn't like them. I, we reviewed that live album. You hated it. It's a live album. I, I need to see the visuals to get mm-hmm. into that. And maybe if I saw the live album, like you said on one of the comments, that I might yeah. like the live album better. Maybe you I mean the stu- the studio album. You mean the studio album? Yeah, maybe I saw that. Yeah, live. I, I'll, I'll say the one thing I really this year that I think they did better than any other year, and you mentioned it was the video screens mm-hmm. were amazing this year, but. Like I said in the comments, honestly, of all the five times I've seen TSO, this was probably my least favorite, even though it was still amazing. But like la- last year, for example, they did one of the things they did was they had these giant inflatable nutcrackers come up on stage and they were like swaying back and forth to the beat of one of the songs. And they and they had all this other stuff going on and they always have like the, the, the fake snow coming down uh, during one of the songs. But they always, no matter what album they're doing, they always put on an amazing show. Yeah, the video screens, they had the fake snow and the video screens that looked like it was falling on the stage. It was pretty, t- pretty like it was in 3D. It was pretty cool. Well, they, they actually do. They, they, there was fake snow. Oh, there was? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I yeah, thought it yeah. was just the screens were doing that. No, like the first like 10 rows or so get fake snow on them. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because that's uh, where whenever the group that I go with, we always get like first 10 row tickets. Yeah. And it, it the, the fake snow comes down and like they go when they go up on the big lifts, they go right over you and stuff. It was funny. We were sitting next to two trans people. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, it, it's honestly it's it, it's it's really neat how like a show like that, the the audience you'll see at a TSO show. I see families with little kids there. I see yep. people with I see people with sabotage shirts on that are like hardcore from bunch way of back. Fans. I always I always wear my Hall of the Mountain King shirt when I go to see TSO. But like you'll see people like that. You'll see people that clearly are like follow TSO around. And then you'll see like 80 year old couples that are just there for a, a, a Christmas show. Yeah, and I it's see. the funniest thing because you have this for all intents and purposes, hard rock band who's just because they're playing Christmas music, the audience is so vast like the kind of people you'll see at a TSO show. And I always love that they do like, they give back to the community. Like they, they donate a dollar from every ticket. It, it was $13,000 to, to a children's hospital in LA. Yeah. They gave to, they, they showed that. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Every, every show they've ever done, they always give $1 from every ticket to a local charity at that show. So like when I saw them a couple of weeks ago, it was to our local Salvation Army. They gave the money to, and every show it's, it's a local charity they give to. Damn. Do those people in the show get paid or is it just they just Oh yeah, of um, course. Yeah. I mean it's it's yeah, that, 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 that's paid. their job for half a year. Cause I mean between the rehearsals and then a the three month tour. We he said sixty shows in forty five days. <laughs> yeah. Like, Damn. That yeah, because they're tiring. they're doing in most places they do two shows a day. So well, they like did two at Anaheim. Yeah. So they'll do an afternoon show and an evening show, and then they're playing because they're doing the East and West Coast tour, they're in two different locations every day. So for 45 days, they're doing possibly four shows a day, depending on which tour you're at. So they, they are all over the place. And the preparation that goes into all that, because you're rehearsing two bands, they have to come up with the set list, all the visuals, the graphics, the people that do the lasers, all the, that all that stuff, learning the show. And they're always like in, integrating new material into the show because like, like I said, this is the fifth time I've seen them, and there's probably seven or eight songs that I that they played this time that I'd never seen them play before. So, like every year, 
even though they'll probably be playing one of like the same four albums for the first half, they're always throwing in stuff you've ne- they haven't played in forever in the second half, and they'll throw in stuff from their non Christmas albums. They'll throw in sabotage stuff. They'll throw in covers. They'll throw in all kinds of stuff. Yeah, man, it looked like the show was over. They said, "Well, it's Friday night. Let's uh, Saturday night. Let's go." And he just started just going because he was thanking everybody. On the mm-hmm. stay, I thought it was over, and I know it kept going. I go, this is yeah, no, that, that's the first half. That every, right. it always tricks everyone because they do the, they like I said they do the. I album. saw people walking out. <laughs> yeah, that's only the first half of the show. Then they do a they whole other like half, hour. The second half was the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, then they do a whole other hour. Have you seen them, Jerry? No, never have. Do you want to see them? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's not on the top of my list, but I've never seen them before. Well, you should see it because you know how much of a hater I was, right? I had a lot no, of hater. I, 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 no, I've seen videos. I know they put on a great show. Mm-hmm. I have a few of their CDs, so I like. I was them. a huge hater, uh, Eric. You were right. Uh, I still don't like Sabotage, but yeah, it's cool, man. But uh, you know, I was looking for stories because you asked me what are we going to talk about. I, said, I don't know. I'll just look through Blabbermouth. I was looking through Blabbermouth and found out I'm fucking old because I don't know half these crusty band, these new bands out there. That- about a blabbermouth and i go i'm gonna go to loudwire <laughs> go, oh god you mean you mean the website that just copies the headlines from blabbermouth and changes pretty the much so, yeah. it was i don't know man <laughs> but i was like fuck who's this man who's this man who's this man who's this guy transitioning i don't fucking know <laughs> transitioning from transitioning i have no idea who the, uh, that person was the, the life of agony yeah i don't know that band you don't know life of agony no <laughs> they were big in the 90s <laughs> Well, in the 90s, I wasn't listening to that stuff. Oh, I forgot. You were still listening to Warrant in the 90s. I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, doggy <laughs> dog, man. <laughs> well, I, I forgot. Was... You 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 weren't exactly on the cutting edge of music in 1994. Well, in, well, 94, dude. I was listening to Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, and all well, that Well, they were stuff. right there. Yeah. River, I... River Runs Red. That was a big album in that, at that time. They weren't on MTV, though. That's probably why I didn't see them. I, I think they were. They were? I don't know. I, I was smoking a lot of weed then. <laughs> I probably missed them. That, that first, I'll tell you what, that first album, it's a great album. Like, if you don't know it, I would check out the, their first album. It's a really good album. All right, man. Do you know them, Jerry? Yeah, I've heard of them. Um, trying to think, what was that one, their, their debut album? I'm trying to think of the name of it. Fuck. Um, oh, is it like River Runs Red? I think it is. Is that what it is? I thought it was another one. Um, I might be right. But uh, yeah, the girl I was seeing, Kelly at the time, really loved that album. So I've you know listened to that quite a bit. So that, that's all I know from them. So they're pretty good. I mean, they weren't bad sounding, if I, if I remember right. I haven't heard them since then. Mm-hmm. So what kind of music are they? Are they like, like death metal, no. like alternative no. metal? Yeah, alternative metal? like they're not I mean, like, like the death, they're not like new metal, are they? No, it's before that. It came out before the first Corn album, so there was no new metal. Oh. Well, <laughs> it I, was I, uh, I, October '93 was when the first album came out. And the first album was "River Runs Red." Okay, um, that's probably that new done. metal was "Faith No More." <laughs> no. Well, did they have an? Did they have one in '95? Because that's when I dated. This yeah, one. that one. That one was called "Ugly." That might be it. Actually, the one that I'm, I listen to quite a bit. Yeah, I've never heard of it. So I'm going to go check out "Life of." Did, when he transitioned into a girl, did he sound like a girl, or did he still sound the same? It was only like like eight or nine years ago that he transitioned. But did but he it was like. To- it was like kind of like everyone kind of knew it was happening because like he was really messed up for a while. Like he was like known for like, well, their whole first album is like a concept album about a, like a teenager that wants to commit suicide. So like it's, it's pretty, pretty dark stuff. Mm. But um, like, I know I'm pretty sure I, I, I know Ian was talking one time about seeing them live and like, he would just kept his head down on stage the whole time. Like wouldn't acknowledge the crowd at all was like, like really just like basically stood behind the drum set for half the, the show and was just like not into it at all. But now even like after, after he transitioned, the fir- like transition, like really interactive with the audience, like in a better place. But now it seems like, I, I don't know the whole, what, what's going on, but um, yeah. I have no idea. I've never heard of that band either, but uh, what about a uh, Sam, uh, Sammy, I was reading more about this story about like John Bonham getting canned or whatever. Not Jason, Jason Bonham. Bonham. Jason Bonham. He he says the reason was that Jason is pretty damn busy. It's like with his projects and his mom and and Kenny plays with Joe Satriani and his solo stuff. So when Joe is free, 
Kenny is free. So uh, that's what I, I was reading. Yeah, but that's not what Jason Bonham was saying. So I'm going to kind of tend to. I'm going to kind of tend to believe Jason Bonham on that, because if it's about his schedule, I think he would know his schedule. So I have no idea what happened there. It's like, did Sammy just turn on him? Because Jason said nothing but good things about Sammy. Yeah, and so. I and like reading the one headline, it sounds like Jason is just as confused as we all are. Yeah, maybe. I don't, people are saying because Kenny is cheaper. How is Kenny cheaper? That guy because, is like Bonham. Because his last name isn't Bonham? Yeah, Maybe. Yeah, but he's Weed's fucking super respected in the music world, man. I mean, seriously, Kenny Arnoff. Of like, course he is, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But I mean, like he's not cheap. I don't think he'd be a cheap. I don't think either bottom. one of them are gonna be yeah. cheap. But if you're gonna compare those two things, I, I think Jason Bottom's probably gonna cost a little bit more. Yeah, I think I, his dad was I think his dad was looking down in heaven and it's like enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, to be fair. Jason Bonham has played on at least one good album. That's more you can say about Sammy Hagar. So oh, that first yeah. Bonham album is pretty good. Oh, the first oh, the I like disregard, both of them. disregard of timekeeping. Yeah, I like, yeah, that's I like pretty both good of those. Pretty good album. They Wait for you. Albums. I love that song. Oh, I love that album. Like, what happened to that singer? Didn't he pass? The guy who yeah. sang Bonham. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Bonham. But uh, I, I, I need to see Jason Bonham's Led Zeppelin experience. I heard that singer he has is pretty. Yeah, pretty good. I heard, I heard good things. Yeah, Jerry, you haven't seen that? Nope. What's wrong with you, Mr. Zeppelin? Doesn't they have to come here first? Oh, they yeah. haven't came to Tennessee. No, I have not seen them. I mean, they probably have, and you know, I, I, maybe I just forgot. I don't know, but I would go to that if it was Nashville or Knoxville, and it hasn't come there yet. I don't know. I, I think Sammy's trying to get Chicken Foot back together. Oh, <laughs> definitely. Um, see, I, and the the best part of that is this is his excuse to get it back together without calling it Chicken Foot and basically right. paying himself more because his name's on top of the billing. Mm-hmm. Well, I think he's got to pay Joe a lot of money too. Oh, so, of course. I mean, it's yeah. Joe Satriani. Joe was making. Like... He he said that him and Joe wrote a song in tribute of Eddie that's going to come out soon. Oh boy! Oh boy! Yeah. <laughs> mm. so, I was going to say that for BS, but we're going to pretend. I can't wait we're going to hear what. We're gonna, yeah, I can see it now. The lyrics are: "We're going to pretend now that we love you, Eddie, even uh-huh. though it's, you know you didn't." Yeah, we're, yeah. Just, I, can't, I can't wait to read Alex's sequel book when he talks all about that song. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh shit! I, I think they're both they're both grumpy commungeons. I, I think life is short, man. Just like make peace. You know, if you hate each other, fuck it. Just say hey. But I know it's about the book. I know why Alex. I, when I read that book, I go, oh shit! He's like telling all the dirt. Uh, fucking the it, it was true, but did he have to say it? No. Well, it's like I got and, and again gonna... and again and again. I, I I still don't believe every single thing Sammy said in that book about Eddie. Yeah, I don't believe anything anymore, really, because everything's a pile of shit when people talk about shit. But uh, I, I don't talk shit about Jerry. I did meet him in Tennessee. Some things happened there. I'm not saying that. No, I'm joking. Oh, God. Only, oh, only oh no, can... no, 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 no. Oh, time out here. That's time out. Sure. We're not. Nope. <laughs> Those things did not. We did share it with B and B, but that's all we shared. All right. <laughs> hey, I was just joking. Nothing happened. Uh-oh, go, uh oh, time to start unfriending people on Facebook. Um, <laughs> except, yeah, right? yeah, I'm offended. I'm gonna. I, I'm, I'm, I'm offended. A, I, time to unfriend people on Facebook. I unfriended myself, by the way. <laughs> you know, you know. It so took you long ju- enough. So there's just me, me and I know myself. No, no more, no more yourself. No my yourself. No, it's just me and I are still my friends, but not myself. Not yourself. Like, no. No. <laughs> no I I, suck. Speaking speaking of cover bands, like. I'm kind of a little pissed. The one cover band tour that I really want to go see, uh, Zach Sabbath and the Iron Maidens. I'm going playing, to that. <laughs> they're playing here on New Year's Eve. Oh, oh wow. It, they're making like a whole big thing out of it. Like it's like a New Year's Eve party kind of thing mm-hmm. at the, the venue that I, it was the venue I saw uh, Testament, Nexodus, and Death Angel at. Um, really, really nice venue. Yeah, speaking but, of Zeppelin cover bands, have you ever seen Zoso before? They're a good cover band. They're, 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 they're on that up. bill, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what made me that's what made me think of it um but yeah i'm like really of all nights i'm like son of, come on son of a bitch <laughs> I, I, I don't i don't want to be driving for an hour and a half to a venue on new year's eve oh no. that's true why don't you just yeah. get an uber and let somebody else drive <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i trust anyone on new year's eve I'm on, uh, that's like true. on the interstate because it's like it's down it's an hour and an a half hour and a half an hour and a half uber interstate. drive that, that's not gonna be cheap no that's uh, that's that's about mm. oh, 150 bucks <laughs> oh shit 
I don't oh, know. Man. I've never taken an Uber. I don't know. Well, it's just like uh, what do you call? You know, Steel Panther. Do you guys like Steel Panther? Mm. Yep. Uh, Michael Starr says we never intended to become a band that makes fun of bands we love. <laughs> yeah, which is sad that they ended up kind of having just like they ended up just being that by just being themselves because yeah. they could still they could make music like that when all these bands like Motley Crue came out on stage and sounded like garbage. Yeah, it's like Michael Starr rules, man. I, I would have loved to have seen that uh, reunion with uh, the David Lee Roth band. He was going to sing and then a bowling alley got fucking. Did you? I was actually about to bring that up. Uh, I saw. Was it you that shared it? That like Steve Steve I made a post. Did you share that or somebody shared it? I saw. Um, a long time ago. Steve Vai just made a post like today. Oh wow! Uh, about like because it was the anniversary of when it was supposed to happen, and he tells the whole story of like what was going to happen, where it was advertised that it was going to be the band and Michael Starr, and the rumors slowly kind of got leaked that. Hey, maybe Dave's going to show up. Maybe Dave's going to show up. And so like the venue got packed and there were still like a couple thousand people standing outside waiting. And the rumors were right. Dave was there. They were going to do it. And um, the way Steve said it was like the guy, the the uh, the manager or like some guy, like the tour manager came backstage and said, hey, the fire marshal said, if we don't shut this down right now, you're going to have to pay a fine because what, what they were going to do was they were going to open up with the Yankee Rose and Steve was literally standing there with his guitar in his hand, ready to play the opening chord of Yankee Rose with the curtain to open up and Dave to walk out on stage. And the guy came backstage and said, Hey, we can't do this because there's like 8,000 people outside about to tear this place down. And the fire marshal said, we are not doing this right now. And so originally it was just that they were going to have to pay a fine and Steve almost played the chord. And then he said, no, don't do it because the whole bar will get shut down. Like everything, like you might, you guys might go to jail for it and stuff. And so finally he's like, yeah, I guess we're not going to do it. So what they ended up doing was they ended up just all taking a big picture together. And then he shared the picture of it was all of them together with Dave backstage after the show that didn't happen. And he's the, he said the funny thing and like Dave must've said to him, you know, the funny thing is, this story is going to be even better than if we actually did it. Yeah. That, it, it that, would, that would have been cool, you know, but Dave, I don't think David could sing anymore. Well, have this was heard... like, what, eight, ten years ago? Yeah. Have you heard This Giddy was like 20, 2016, I think it was. Yeah. So, I mean, this was, this is right, like, this is what, a year after the last Van Halen tour? Well, I did which, see I mean, that he didn't, last Van Halen He didn't tour. sound great on the last Van Halen tour, no, but he, it sounds a lot better than he does now. Live in Japan was horrible. Yeah. Well, that oh, was 2012. God, dreadful. Yeah. You know, but there there's a few sal- salvageable songs on that. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it right. The, 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 the songs that he's not trying to, like, blow his voice like, out. Beautiful like, the Songs that, is really good. Yeah, like, some of the songs where he's, like, singing lower in the register and kind of just having fun with it, they're manageable, but... Yeah, some of that stuff is whoo hot garbage. I know Dave Lee Roth isn't watching this. David, you know what you could do and make a lot of money on it? Do old blues songs. Do mm-hmm. some freaking old blues songs, man. Do like stuff like Ladies Night in Buffalo, where you just like sitting there talking, singing. That's your register now, man. Do that shit because we love that shit. Do it because you rule at the blues, man. You got the blues. I tell, I tell you what, I hate I hate to say it and I hate to bring this guy up, but it it kind of worked for Paul Stanley. <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. I, I liked Soul Station. That yeah, was like, it, it, I it, thought it, it was fit. good. Like, yeah. everyone knows Paul's voice is cooked, but, like, that stuff actually kind of fit his voice without him having to overdo it. He was having a fun time doing it, just kind of went along with it. It was probably a little bit of studio magic, but even, like, some of the live footage, it sounded fine. Like, you're absolutely right. Like, get something that Dave can like have some fun with, but is way more in his register than trying to sing freaking Panama. Oh God. I saw that today. I was like, why? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> oh my God. But getting up was a lot better. That was more in his register, but it was more country feel to me. You know, I was like, yeah, but why can't you sing? Just sing fucking blues, man. Sing some old blues standards. Make some blue. Like, that's life is totally something you could sing. sing that's some what I mean. Sinatra, Sinatra shit. Well, and and that, that's there. the kind of exactly. music Dave loves. 
Yeah. That, that's that's the stuff that's right up his alley. He doesn't like rock music. Yeah, man. He needs to sing because I he he is a hero of mine. Like it or not, I get shit because I like Sammy. I do love Dave Lee Roth. And it's disappointing when I go buy albums and they suck by him. It's like I, the your filthy little mouth. You got one song. She's my machine. The different rest kind of the album of truth. is garbage. I like a different kind of truth, by the way. So fuck you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> fucking, I love that fucking. I love that fucking album. It just, it's yeah. it's kind of brick wall. I think they it, need, no, the production's awful. Production's awful, but like they sounds, need they need like a ma- like if any if any album ever needed a major overhaul. Like a, like a vapor trails level overhaul. Yeah. So, so what do you think, man? I I'm hearing like Ralph is talking about he likes the original vapor trails mm-hmm. better than a remix, and I I don't agree with him. I like yeah. them both. See, here's my thing. My thing is I never really knew the original. By the time I got into Rush or like really knew Rush, I mean, of course, I was always into Rush. My dad had the old albums. But by the time I really started digging into Rush's back catalog myself, this has the remix. Yeah. That's what I know. I know the remix. The remix sounds amazing. Too. Like this is this is what I know. And so this has the remix on it. And so for me to actually listen to the original, I'd have to go out of my way to try to find the original because this has the remix in it. And I, I love what they did I with the remix. I can send you the original on Dropbox. I'm fine. I'm fine. fine. I have this. I I don't need more than one copy of this album. Right. I, lo- I like was this right. album. Ralph was right. There was a little bit more solos on the original. Mm-hmm. And But Alex said when they went into recording that, he did want to do a lot of solos on that album. He just wanted yeah. to be, you know, so it made sense that they remix it that way. And I, I just listened to Getty Lee's book, My F and Life, and he was talking about the making of that album, that it... He is like the perfectionist in that band. He did not like the mix and it irritated him. Mm-hmm. It totally irritated him. It's like they put it out too fast. He said, hey, I want to hear this. Oh, it's already done. Well, here's another. And right, it was literally, I think, within like a year of that. Because that was like, that was 02, right? Yeah. Okay. In 03, a band that I really love that I think, and I talked about it recently, that I think deserves a way more credit. Uh, the band Nevermore put out a really good album called Enemies of Reality with a producer that they weren't used to working with and they hated the way it sounded and the label rushed it out. And so the album sounded horrible. Everyone said it sounded horrible. The songs are great. They said it sounded really off. And so like two years later, Andy Sneap, who now everybody knows for Judas Priest, really, really great producer, went back in and completely remixed that album, put it out again. And it's amazing. And so That's like what some of these albums need, like something like different kind of truth. The songs are there. Like, in my opinion, like so many great songs. I'll never, I'll never understand releasing tattoo as the first single. I'll never understand that. I will never understand that. Like Chinatown as is she's the woman bullet head. Yeah. Stay frosty. So many amazing songs. That that album sucks. I you love suck. so many of these songs, <laughs> but the production is just not there. And for that to be the last thing that Van Halen releases, it it, it kind of sucks because, like I said, the songs are there, the production isn't. And I think, I, I know Jerry, I'm not necessarily talking about Jerry here. I know he just really doesn't like the album. I think that really kind of keeps the album from being better in a lot of people's eyes is the production. But I think like, so, Jerry, if it was produced a lot better you might like it because the songs are really no, good the dude. songs are awful especially really? like They're... late lately with like all these great remixes that are coming out of classic albums like all the stuff that steven wilson's done for black sabbath and jethro toll and yes and all these albums that he's remixed or the stuff like when genesis did their remix series in 07 like all these remixes that are coming out recently shows the amount that you can do even with great albums i mean like these are the things that are they're doing with albums that didn't need touched imagine what they could do with albums that did need a little bit of help like there's so many albums out there like like, i I have practically have a wish list of like here's all the albums that i think really need a remix somebody please do these albums (laughs) because like i I, and i know it'll never happen because metallica is too stupid about it justice needs a major remix um that I agree with. 
a couple Kiss albums could do with a major, like the fr- a couple of the early Kiss albums, I think could do with a major remix. I think the f- everyone always points to Hotter Than Hell. I don't think so. The first album, I think, needs a major remix because I think the first album just sounds so flat, and it's that Kenny Kerner, Richie Wise production that is just so awful. Because if that is true, that the the, the double platinum versions are much oh amazing, so amazing. I never listened. I I own the first album on CD. I never listened to it. Like, I don't need to listen to it. If you if I want to listen to those songs, I'll put on double platinum. But like, you get someone even just to make it sound more like Dress to Kill. Because I think the Dress to Kill production is amazing. I love what they did on. I love what Neil Bogart did on Dress to Kill. Like I think it's a great production. But I, I just that first album always was lacking something to me. Because I love the way I love the way Hotter Than Hell sounds, and I love the way Dress to Kill sounds. But I just never the first album just it just sounds hollow. It just there's just nothing there. It looks like they literally just went into a studio, played something. The guys pressed a button, and said, "Cool, we'll put it on some vinyl and sell it." Dang. Uh, what well, you you brought up Metallica? I think they need a re-recording of Saint Anger because I like the songs. I just don't like. I don't. The oh, I love the songs. The lyrics are really fucking good. I think the songs are garbage. Yeah, I think it should be redone with Trujillo. I think they should just redo the whole album. I would be interested if they redid it with Trujillo, added some solos, and cut some of those songs down. Yeah. Because, well, like, some of them are way too long and pointless. I First of all, I think some of the lyrics are garbage, like Frantic. Oh, I love Frantic. Oh, I don't my like life, this, I don't like my lifestyle. What, what's the lyric? Um, my lifestyle determines my death style. Frantic tick 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 tick. I tick, love talk. that tick 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 talk, but I can't listen to the album because the drums sound uh, like shit. God damn, it just irritates me to try to listen to it. Like, here's my thing: the album that I think needs re, re either remixed or re-recorded is not Saint Anger. The album I think needs remixed or recorded is Death Magnetic because I think those are good songs. Well, they did I on just, the on the Apple. I just can't, li- but it's not a full remix. Oh. It's just they they decompressed it a little bit and made it like easier to listen to because I I straight up if I if if I that's why I don't own it on CD I straight up can't listen to that album like it hurts my head to listen to that album. Oh, I love that album, dude. But like some of the songs are so great on that album, and I can't listen to them. And I love I would love I'd love a similar thing. Cut the album down a little bit because it's a very long album, and I think some of the songs like even even some of the songs I love on. Hardwire, which I love almost that entire album. Some of those songs just go on forever. And I think that's Metallica's big problem over the last three or four albums, even back into the load days a little bit, but mainly with like Saint Anger, Death Magnetic, Hardwired, and 72 Seasons, is they're trying, on one hand, they're trying to be Merciful Fate and cram like 800 riffs into every song, and I don't think you need to. Like every once in a while, fine. So like on something, on something like Atlas Rise, it works really well. But then there's songs where it's like, oh, there's a new riff, cool. Oh, there's a new riff, cool. And it just gets old kind of quick, and you just, like, you miss out because you're just trying to cram as many riffs as you can into the same song, and it just kind of diminishes all of them. But I I think that if they would slim down Death Magnetic a little bit and remix it, I think it would be one of my favorite Metallica albums, honestly. And get rid of Unforgiven Three. Fuck that song. Oh, you can get rid of Unforgiven Three. Yeah, I agree with that shit. Oh, you can get right. you can get rid of Unforgiven Two as well. I like Unforgiven Two. Yeah, Ooh. Three. I don't. That's three, what I said. Two, three, four, I, five. Yeah, I like the, the first one. one. I like the first one. They didn't need to do any more of them. <laughs> no, but of, uh, all, of all the songs that they could do sequels to, that was not one they needed to do sequels right? to. Right. <laughs> Hey, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chris Sinzak, that Mooger ain't here passing out because I know you like that. Because uh, uh, there's a there's an episode coming up with Beak the Geek. I'm not going to say what happened, but he talked about that. But uh, I was actually on an episode of Decibel Geek preview. But I'm not going to say I I'm not going to say what happened. No spoilers. I never get spoilers. But uh, check that out when it comes out. But also. What do you guys think of? I, I don't know this band that well, Jerry. We ha, we did release the Seven Keys album review. We still need to do part two. Keeper Andy Seven Keys. DeRee says the next Halloween album should be more happy, confident, and more easy listening to the self titled EP. LP, I mean. Yeah. I'm I all for so. 
Yeah, I'm all for going back to that sound. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're a solid fucking band, so um, I Which, would love for them to go yeah. back to what they what they what they do what they did best. I mean, seriously, they were an upbeat band. Yeah, I mean, listen to those first couple albums. It's a, they're an upbeat band. Like, I, I it, it sucks because I love what they're doing right now, which is something that like every band's fan base wishes they would do is to like combine lineups. For like the last ten years, they've been touring with three singers. Damn! Like, literally, pretty much almost anyone who was ever in the band is currently in the band. Yeah. Like they're touring with three guitar players, three singers, a drummer, and a bass player, and like basically their entire classic lineup from the first three albums, plus the next singer after that, and an extra guitar player. I didn't and, know that. Yeah, yeah, because they're touring. They're, they they brought back in 2016. They brought Kai Hansen back, who sang on the yeah. first album and then played guitar on the on both Keeper albums. Um, because he didn't he he didn't think he could sing and play guitar at the same time, um. So he just focused on playing guitar. They brought in um Kiski on Keeper Part One and Two, and he was their band. He was the vocalist for like seven or eight years, and then they had Andy Darris, who's been the vocalist ever since. And then in 2016, it was like a, it was a pretty deep animosity between Kiski and the band for 30 years, and so they brought. Um, Kai Hansen back and Michael Kiske back in in 2016 and basically reunited almost all of the classic lineup plus the singer they've had for the previous 30 years and so it's like they're the only band that's ever really done that cons- like on a long term basis aside from like a show here or there where they bring like a former member or something out they've been touring with this kind of hodge they call it the Pumpkins United lineup They've been touring with that lineup for the past almost 10 years now. I would like to see that. Something it's really like good. They have an awesome live uh, album and video out. They just put another one I one hate out. power metal, but I like Halloween, man. Yeah. yeah. Like, they... So, like, I, and, they'll, and what they'll do is they'll do a ton of stuff from Keeper Part 1 and 2. They'll do some stuff from the later albums that Darius will sing on, and then they'll do, like, a like a 10 or 15-minute medley from Walls of Jericho that Kai Hansen will sing every night and it's really really cool uh but that being said that was all in preface to saying the album that they did in 2017 or 2018 with this lineup not good not really good i was not a fan at all ralph hates it ralph really hates it and ralph's a huge halloween fan he even loves some of the albums that are like weird in the 90s but he loves man of war yeah we all know ralph loves man of war uh, Al, Al Horta was seeing Man of War last night, I think. Yeah, I think Ian made a comment on that. <laughs> no. Mm. I'm with we Ian. I'm we, with all, Ian. We, we all know what Ian thinks about Man well, of War. I, I'm with Ian on that shit. And I got Yeah, but I don't, I don't I don't think I don't think you're as I don't think you're vehement, as vehemently against it as Ian is. Oh, because Ian had to <laughs> listen to a whole album to review. So I feel his pain <laughs> on that one because I had to I, you know what? I need to listen to more Night Demon. I only listened to their first album. I didn't like the first. I didn't like the first album at all. But I need to listen to them more because they're probably good. I'm just like giving it shit because Jerry liked it just to be a dick, you know. Sorry, Jerry. I love you with Halloween. I I would definitely love for them to go back to that kind of classic sound on the next album because they have all the band members there to do it, and they all still sound great. Like all the vocalists sound great, but like the last album, just it wasn't them. Like it just didn't sound like them, and. I don't know. I, I definitely love for them to go back to that sound. But that being said, they are absolutely ripping it up live right now. I'm pissed off at myself because they came here like I think last year and I didn't go. Um, but next time they come out, I'm definitely going to see them live because they put on one hell of a show. And especially with this lineup, you're getting a like a full two and a half hour show, and none of the singers ever get tired because they keep switching singers. So like you you're able to go through this whole show where They'll do songs from Keepers with Kiski. They'll do, uh, like the, I said, the Walls of Jericho block with Kai Hans, and then they'll do stuff with Andy Darris. Um, but yeah, they just, they're absolutely tearing it up live right now. I, I heard Survivor did that with uh, Jimmy and uh, Dave. Did they? Yeah, they did that. And then uh, Jimmy died because he took cocaine. Fucking ruined that shit for me because I wanted to see that shit. I love yeah. 
Dave Beckler and I love Jimmy Jamerson. I love both those singers. <laughs> but uh, Yes did it, but Steve Held was a little bitch well, on that tour. <laughs> mm, I, for, I forgot about the Union tour. <laughs> hey, no, I saw if, that at the forum. It's really good, dude. I'll tell you what. Oh, no, the, the video is great. I love it. it sounds yeah. great. I would love to read a book all about that tour because it just sounds like the most miserable experience of all time. I think Steve because Howell had an ego. I don't think half of them wanted to be there. <laughs> well, he got he got outshined big time by a superior guitar player. Trevor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Trevor kicked his ass, dude. I'm, I'm sorry. Time. It's like watch Steve Howell vi- could watch not those, keep up with him. Watch those videos, dude. Yeah. I mean, seriously, Trevor owned Steve back then. Sorry. Yeah, Trevor, but that, that was also that was not a great time in Steve Howe's life, I guess. But Steve Howe's a great guitar player. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. Man. He's a great guitar player, but Trevor blows him away to me and Jerry at least. You know? I, I, th- I think it's a different kind of guitar playing, though. Like if if I'm listening to like the stuff from like close to the edge, I I want Steve Howe playing that. But I do think, just in general, I think Trevor is a better guitar player. Um, but like, I, I can't picture anybody but Steve Howe doing that classic Yes. Listen stuff. to Trevor doing those songs, those classic Yes songs. He does. Oh, I have. I've seen him yeah. do it. But I think just there's something about the way Steve does it. Well, I mean, it's Steve's song, so I get yeah. that. You know, so which is like it's weird. It was weird at the Hall of Fame seeing Steve Howe do "Owner of a Lonely Heart." Yeah. Like that's not his song. No. What about uh, Steve Howell said he hated the album Toro Mato? I'm not. Oh, they all did. They it's all a, it's did. a it's an ass album. You know, I don't think I think I skipped that album. I went to drama. Good. <laughs> that was the album with that was the album with "Don't Kill the Whale" on it. Ugh. Ooh. Ugh. I think I did hear that song. Oh, that is. It bad. is not good. Not good. What Which happened? Sucks what? because they had a really good comeback in the late seventies with "Going for the One." Yeah. Which is a really great album. And then they did Tormato the next year, and I don't think anyone wanted to be there. That was the album that basically that was the album that made John Anderson quit. That was the album that made Rick Wakeman quit. And then Drama next yeah. album, right? Yeah, Drama which is, rules. <laughs> which that was supposed to be like that. Uh, the history of Yes to me is so fascinating because like almost never in any other band was there such this massive collection of egos that early in their career. Yeah, like they're like what four or five albums in, and they got massive egos, and they're blowing up on each other. You got Rick Wakeman sitting at his organ eating curry because he hates the music so much. Like, it's just, it, it's really fascinating. Like the history of that band is so funny because like they went through so many lineup changes. It's it, it's hard to even figure out what the classic lineup of Yes is because they went through so many lineup changes because. You couldn't go two or three albums in a row without them having somebody different because you had the first two albums that had that lineup and they brought Steve Howe in on the Yes album. And that still had um, uh, Tony Kay on keyboards. And then they bring in Rick, Rick Waitman. And then an album later, Bill Bruford leaves. They bring in Alan White. Alan White's my favorite drummer. In yes. And then he was on through the rest of the, basically the rest of their history yeah. until they brought Bruford back in with the Union stuff. Um, and then you had all the lineup changes. You had Rick Wakeman leaving. They bring in Patrick Moraz for a hot minute. He leaves. They bring Wakeman back with going for the one, which, like I said, was a really, really great comeback album in the late seventies that people really don't talk about enough. And then they followed it up with the garbage that was Tormato. Then Anderson and Wakeman leave, and they bring in the Buggles to do drama, <laughs> which is one of my absolute favorite Yes oh, albums. Uh, into the lens, dude. Then oh, the yeah. whole lineup just blows up. They start demoing stuff for what was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a uh, Chris Squire solo album, right? Yeah, I think so. Or it was supposed to be like a different band, like yeah. the 90125. Oh, that was supposed to be Cinema. Cinema, yeah. yeah. It was supposed to be Cinema. They bring in John Anderson to sing on it, and they release it as a Yes album. They do all that, 90125, Big Generator. John Anderson gets fed up and leaves. They do the Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Hal stuff, which that album's kind of hit or miss to me. Then the label's like, hey, wait, why don't you all do one big album? That could never blow up in anybody's face. <laughs> Let's just have Trevor Rabin write the entire album. We'll have John Anderson sing on the whole album, and we'll just like pick and choose who gets to play on each song. <laughs> 
and then all that stuff in the and then ever since like i, I honestly I, I i don't know if there is one band that has as complicated of a lineup history as yes for a band that like most music fans could barely name three members of yeah it's like i my my i got into yes because of trevor raven because mm -hmm. of oh most people did in the 80s i got that's where i got into them i love trevor's voice besides the guitar playing him and john just sound amazing together him john well, yeah, that's why that's why changes is one of my favorite yes songs. him john and chris it's like amazing vocalizations on yeah. that shit it's like i do i got into yes and it was just so good with them and i went back and i because i heard those songs live on the big generator tour and i went and saw union and i love steve Howell. he's great i i like gtr i like his stuff but yes isn't yes except for the drama album without john anderson without john anderson except for the drama album i don't like yes mm -hmm. i need john anderson there well, it also it also doesn't help that the stuff they've done over the past 20 years is just not good like it would basically the way i describe yes now is they just take themselves too seriously musically mm -hmm. like the albums they've done and especially since chris squire died it's just not good it's it just sounds like cheap copies of themselves and, and it's just I'm, I'm not a fan to be completely yeah. honest they still sound great live like I the mean, lineup that is still in this band right now with steve howe and jeff downs and the rest of the lineup that they have is really good but anytime they release new music i just can't get into yeah, it no pretty they, much well, yes yes that ever since Squire died well chris yeah. Squire died yes died yeah I agree and and that. to be completely honest the last time i actually enjoyed new studio music from yes was talk oh, talk was amazing that's pretty much the last. I, I like some of the stuff on Keys to Ascension. Yeah, I do too. But after that, it's just it's not magnification. The latter, none of that is good. Yeah, I I think they just went bougie on us. Yeah, <laughs> they went really. Bougie. But then again, now you can kind of see they're the only band of that generation in that style of music that's still putting out new music. King Crimson's yeah. not putting out new music. Genesis isn't putting out new music. Well, like there's nobody that sing in Genesis anymore unless people goes but, back. That's my thing, is like yeah. this style of music kind of died out. And yes, it's the only band that's still putting it out. And so it kind of sounds a little forced because it doesn't sound authentic because it's not what's here anymore. Mm -hmm. Now there are some bands that are doing that style of music very authentically. I can't get into most of it. I know Jimmy James Schwartz absolutely adores a band called Big Big Train that is really kind of emulating that style of music. I can't get into it at all. I love Marillion, who kind of melds that style of music with kind of like a little bit of like Pink Floyd and U2 kind of to kind of do a different sound. And I really like their music, but it's not like a complete copy of what yes is doing and i i just don't think yes sounds authentic anymore and that's that's my issue with it is there any prog bands any newer prog bands out there doing anything besides dream theater oh a ton there's a ton of newer prog bands it's just it's not mainstream because it's that music hasn't been mainstream in 30 years at least yeah sad like there's a lot of like there's a lot of pastoral prog bands out there i mean there's this there was a, a huge prog fest in my area for like 10 straight years. Every year they'd have a, a really big prog fest in my town. Like big bands would come. I knew ever knew it existed because it was really underground. But like Neil Morse from Spock's Beard would play, would well, like play there. Beard. Um, A whole bunch of like really kind of well-known prog bands would play at this little thing. But it's just it's not mainstream in the slightest. Like there's, it, you look on a lot, like, especially like you look at like some of these like lab, like labels like Frontiers or some of these other labels, like there's a lot of bands like that that are still putting out music or are newer bands. Um, a lot of them will feature at least one member of a famous band. 
So like Mike Portnoy's in 50 different bands, Neil oh, yeah. Morse. Um, colors. Um, some of the, like, uh, Pete Chiravis, the bass player from Marillion, was in Transatlantic with Neil Morse and, uh, and Mike Portnoy. So you kind of see a lot of these musicians, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, musicians that Steve Hackett will have in his band when he does his Genesis tours are in a lot of these different bands. You'll have uh, a lot of these bass players and drummers that he gets with him that are in a ton of these like neo prog bands that are putting out some really, really good music. It's just, it's just not mainstream in the slightest because progressive rock has not been mainstream since the seventies. Yeah. It got up there a little bit and then it just died, you know, well, progressive rock in that form, in like yeah. the kind of more pastoral, because there was progressive rock in the eighties. It was more electro, and then progressive metal kind of had a little bit of a resurgence in the nineties with Dream Theater and Fate's Warning and stuff like that. But after that, it just, it just really faded into obscurity, and it's still out there. But it's just it, it it's it's like I don't going to a little have, theater. I don't think people have the patience to listen to progressive rock anymore. Probably not, honestly. Probably not. Yeah. And honestly, it's just it, 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 it's 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 so far removed from what most people listen to. Yeah. Like it, it, it is like if people thought stuff like yes and Genesis was uncool in the 70s, think about what that kind of stuff is now. Yeah. It, it's 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 but really yes, not cool. Genesis went pop prog though. Exactly. And that's what yeah. they did. They, they did this. They did it to stay alive. Yeah. King Crimson with the, with the discipline lineup. Went I need to a listen bit to more. King Crimson. I need to check them out, man. I, 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 if you, if you're ever looking to dive into King Crimson, I can give you about 10 different places to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, honestly, I, I really would love to see what you think of the album Thrack. It was one of their later albums from 95. Send it uh, to me like a, a link or something. On yeah, I'll send, I'll send you a link. It's a really, really good album. Sounds nothing like their 70s stuff, but it was when uh, in their history, they, they did what was called the double trio lineup in the 90s where it was um, Bill Bruford, Tony Levin, who was in Peter Gabriel's band. I love Tony Levin. Uh, and is in um, uh, Liquid Tension Experiment. Yeah. And um, Adrian Ballou who was in Frank Zappa and David Bowie's band. He was in the, the, the Discipline. It was basically the Discipline lineup of King Crimson plus two other musicians. So it was two drum sets, two guitarists, two bass players. And it was a really, it was a really cool kind of sound because it, there's not a lot of bands where you'll have an album with two drummers. Frank Zappa did it a couple times. Uh, a couple other bands have done it, but like it just gives you such a unique kind of sound. Uh, that really can't be copied. And I, that's one of my favorite King Crimson albums is, is Thrack. I'll send you the link to it. It's a really, really interesting and unique album. Nice. I'll, I'll look at, you send me the link, I'll check mm -hmm. it out on Amazon Music on the way to work. So I, I do like to hear stuff that I haven't heard. You know, it's really cool. Jerry, man, what's up, man? Oh, nothing, man. I got to run, guys. Something yeah, just let's came get, up. Yeah, so. let's get the fuck out of here, man. Cool. Miners are sucking as usual this year. Y'all take care, man. I love you guys. Go Steelers, whatever. Uh, I hope the See Lions win the, win the championship. Later, Joseph. Thank you, man. See ya. Take it.